And you can kind of follow along with the program there. Um, statistics, we're not going to talk much about that. It's the thing of organizing data. If you look at the graph there on page 211, that bar graph there, we talked about this before. But what is the most important thing when you see a bar graph? When you see a bar graph, you shouldn't just look at it and go, oh, that's pretty. I love pretty things. Sam, you should look at, look at the title. And the title of this one is Favorite Activities. And then after you look at the title, you should probably look at Ethan. Page 211, sir. After you look at the title of that graph, which says favorite activities, what do you suppose you should look at second? What part of the graph, Ethan, should you look at second? John? Um, what we're comparing. Yeah, look at the, look at the items there. What, what favorite activities are we looking at? Team sports, dance, walking slash jogging, everybody's favorite things. And then after that, you want to look at the other measurements there. You want to figure out what's the scale. What does every line stand for in that graph? Does every line stand for one? What's the scale used? Olivia, every line is five. What? Very good. See, now we've got... We are looking at the favorite activities between all those things of these people here. And then the question they ask is, what type of exercise is most popular among Patricia's classmates? Shockingly enough, it is, Connor? Team, team sports. Team sports. About how many people like team sports would you say that is? Twelve sounds like a very good number. Good. Well, then we're going to stop with that. Then what we're going to actually, first thing we're talking about is a line plot. So write this down. Line plot. And just for fun, when I ask you, um, just tell me how many brothers slash sisters you have, whatever, just to give us some, some data here. Ephraim, you have? Two. Two. John? Two. Two, Charlie. One. One, Liv. Two. Ethan. Three. Siblings. Don't so you have three? three. CJ. Two. Look at that, Sam. Two. Man, everybody knows. Boy. Five. Oh man, five. Leah. One. Zero. Brennan. Two. Shh. Ronnie. Zero. Zero. Uh, Lacey? One. One. Lillian? Two. Two. Kate? Two. Two. And four. four. All right. So, by the way, the, the numbers we just collected there are the data. <laughs> And we call this, because it's not organized, this is raw data. And we are going to do a line plot to organize it. And it's a very simple little procedure. Is what you do is you draw a line. And on your line, you have the numbers that are all in your graph. We go all the way from 0 to 5. So we're going to go 0, 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, and a 5. And you just simply put an X above each number for your data. So here's a 2. I put one X above a 2. A second 2, I put a second X. A 1, I put an X above the 1. A third 2, boom. A 3. Another 2. I'm going to run out of 2s. Another two, a five, a zero, another two, a zero, a one, and a couple more twos, and a four. And a four. And a line plot, which is what this is. No. Then your data gets a little bit more organized. You can look at it. Usually when you look at line plots, one of the things you look at is a little cluster. Cluster means where, you know, where do most of the things seem like they fall? And if you look at this, 
know, you are looking at, you know, this kind of area right here. More people have 0, 1, and 2 than have 3, 4, and 5. Specifically, or specifically, specifically, 2 seems to be the common number of siblings here. How much leaves the crowd as it would be? The three seems I wonder what the national average is. What do you think the national average is? Two. 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 I'll bet it's two point something. Oh, yeah, most kids have three. Two. Yeah. I'll bet it's more or less than that. There. Um, take a look at the bottom of page 211 there. Again, looking at number of visits to the city park per week. Where do you see the cluster? The question asks you between what numbers? Most of the residents went to the city park how many times a week? That's what you say most of them are. How many times a week? Olivia? One. Well, yeah, but they're looking for kind of a cluster, so kind of a range. Oh, zero, one, or two. Yeah, probably zero to two, or even three if you want to look at that good. Now, flip the page. Under our data, we have to talk about this. When we come to data, we have what's called qualitative. Make sure I spell that right. Qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative and quantitative. You know, like quantity and quality. What do you suppose is the difference in those two different types of data? If I asked you what 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 quantity of what is the quantity of your pencils, what would you say? John says two. Two, two. Quantity answers how many? Whereas quality, if I said what is the quality of your pencils? How many in all? Well, no, quality is like characteristics. A quality would be like what color is your pencil? Um, you know, quantitative is numbers, and qualitative is what things, you know, it's quality, it's characteristics, you know, it's color, um, it's what it's made of, you know, because they make pencils out of, some pencils are made out of wood, some pencils are made out of plastic, some are made out of wood. That is qualities compared to quantities. And they go on to say this. Take a look at you on page 212 now. It says there, just above, just under those blue words, Roger. Anybody know anybody named Roger? Roger collected quantitative data when he asked about the number of visits in the park each week. Patricia collected qualitative data when she asked about the students' favorite sports. So number one, you are supposed to say, is this quantitative or qualitative? Number one, Jagdish. Thank goodness none of you are named that. <laughs> collects 50 bags of clothing for a clothing drive and counts the number of items in each bag. Is that a qualitative or quantitative? Counting the number in each bag is Charlie. Quantity. Yeah, it's a quantity. It's how many? Number two, for one hour, Carlos notes the color of each car that drives past his house. Color, Chloe, is? Qualitative. Yeah, qualitative. Number three, Sharon rides a school bus home. For two weeks, she measures the time the bus takes to make the trip. Measures the time. Sam? Quantity. Yeah, it's a quantity. It's a quantity. How much time? Uh, four, Brigitte. Ask each student in a class, what is your favorite holiday, New Year's, Thanksgiving, or Independence Day? Charlie, that is? Uh, quality. Yeah, that's a quality. That's a quality. But you're looking for your favorite, yeah. It's said how many, yeah. Number five, Marcelo asked each player in this Little League team, which Major League Baseball team is your favorite, right? Which team do you like the least? Qualitative or quantitative? Ethan? Quality. Yeah, what qualities or qualities? And number six, no, we don't have to do that. For questions, no, we don't have to do that. 
this question will give you quantitative data. How many hours a week do you spend watching television? We record the number of hours a person watches TV. Then we organize it from least to greatest. We display it in a line plot. The line plot illustrates 32 people, blah, 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 blah. Wait, is there a question in the future here? Gosh, if they asked you that question, how many hours does anybody watch TV anymore? Most of you guys spend it on games, don't you? Know? Two hours a night? Sitcoms. Sports news, animation, sitcoms, and movies. Turn the page. Here is another thing to think about here. Somebody read that paragraph on page 214 at the very top. 214 at the very top. Olivia? Often is not realistic to pull an entire population. It, in these cases, a small part of the population is there. We call this a small part. We call this small part a sample. Surveyors must carefully select their samples because different samples will provide different data. It is important that the sample of for a population be a representative sample. That is the characteristics of the sample should be similar to those of the entire population. In order to do this, researchers often randomly select participants for a survey from the entire population. Okay, so in case you got where they were going there, what they're saying is, you know, for example, Facebook and all those all those people, they gather information about people because they try to figure out who the best people to advertise to, to sell whatever project or products or whatever it is. Or like when there's an election, remember they always give projected before the election, they always say, well, this person's ahead in the polls. You know, well, they can't ask every single person in the United States or in the state of Illinois. They're not going to call up every person in the state of Illinois and say, who are you going to vote for for governor? Would you tell me that? They take a random sample. You know, they'll take 30 people, and from that they'll say, well, if 17 of those 30 people are voting for this person, that person's going to win because 17 is more than half, and they'll figure that out. But the problem with that is you have to be careful when you take a random sample because if you don't take the random sample at the right place or whatever, you can get what we call bias. I'm sure you probably talked about that in another class. It would be a little like this. You know, if you wanted to figure out what percentage of the population of Yorkville likes to read, what percent of Yorkville likes to read? So you're going to take a random sample. So what would be wrong? Why would it be not smart to stand outside of Yorkville Public Library and as people walk in, you just randomly pick somebody to ask the question, do you like to read? Why would that probably not give you an, e uh, of, of, uh, uh, an accurate representation, Brenda Massey? Because they're going into a library. Because they're going into a library, which automatically you're going to have a lot more people who like to read going into a library, so they're, uh, it's already biased towards that. Or if you were polling on who somebody, what percent of the population is going to vote for whatever person in the office. Why would you probably not stand outside of a church and poll all those people? Well, because generally speaking, people who go to church are more conservative. They're probably going to vote for it. If you wanted to get a good sampling of somebody who wanted or whatever read, where, where would be good places to take random polls of people who like to read? And where, where would you get just a mixture of people that, you know, wouldn't matter what, they, what they're reading or whatever? You probably wouldn't stand next to a newspaper stand if there is such a thing anymore, because obviously people are reading newspapers. But you could go, Connor, to... A store, but not like a bookstore. Yeah, not a bookstore, but maybe just Jewel. I mean, would you get... I mean, Jewel. People like... Everybody likes to eat whether they read or not, right? So most people are going to buy groceries. You know, you could go just about anywhere. Um, would you go to a movie place? Yeah. I don't know. Would, would people who don't like to read be more apt to go to movies? 
Mm-hmm. Unless if it's like a book or if it's a movie based about on a book, movie. then maybe you have some slant sort of there. So you have to be careful. Um, you know, it's it's a little on the deceptive side. It's a little like this. You know, when you're watching a TV ad and they say, you know, you can buy, you can buy medicine, medicine, medicine at a fraction of the cost. Why is that almost a silly statement to begin with? Does anybody know? It? We sell our cars at a fraction of the cost you'll normally pay. Ephraim? Because you can't have a fraction. Yeah, you can have fractions. True, let's say, you know, the normal medicine costs $50, and the fraction of it, they will sell their stuff for a half. Half of 50 is? $25. Maybe they sell it for $25, but what happens if the fraction of the cost they sell it for is um, an improper fraction? What if they sold it for three halves the fraction? That's still a fraction of the cost. Fraction of means to multiply. Guess what three halves times 50 is? 75 dollars. So you could legitimately say we sell our medicine for a fraction of the cost and actually charge them more than somebody else because your fraction is more than a more than a, more than one. You can't, I mean, or pennies on the dollar. You can buy our cars for penny on the dollar. Well, what if their pennies are 99 pennies of the dollars? How much are you really saving? One penny for every dollar. So you, you have to be careful because you can say whatever you want and justify it. You know, it, it makes it seem like a fraction, makes it seem small. Pennies on the dollar makes you think you're paying really less, but that doesn't necessarily be the case. Now, let's look at the questions that they give us. See if we can find some bias in this. In problem 7 and 8, explain why each sample is not representative. How would you expect the sample's response to differ from those? Number 7, to determine public opinion in the city of Miami about a proposed leash law for dogs, Sally interviews shoppers in several Miami pet stores. Why would that not be a good place to talk about people about leashes for dogs? Charlie. Um, because they might not, they might just be looking. Nah, well, no, Ronnie. Because they're dog people. Yeah, they already have dogs, so they're probably going to be in favor. I don't know what dog people would be in favor. They'd probably be in favor of not having leashes because they're dogs. You know those kind of people whose dogs can do no wrong, and then they come and they would just about bite off your leg, and then they'll say, "Oh, they don't mean it. They're not. They're just." They're really nice if you get to know them. Yeah, you don't want to, you know, since they're going into a pet place, they're probably pet lovers, and they probably don't want to put leashes because, really, should you tie up a dog? No, probably not. Not if you're like a dog lover, just like not cutting down trees, even though trees grow back. Don't cut them down. Number eight. How about Tamika? Tamika wants to to know the movie preference of students in her middle school. Since she's in the school orchestra, she chooses to survey orchestra members. Why might that sway somebody's movie preferences if you do just people in the orchestra, Ephraim? Because um, if they're in the orchestra, they're probably more interested in singing music instead. So what kind of music, or what kind of movies would they probably most prefer? Um, musicals. Musicals and singing sort of thing. So you have to be a little careful of, of the uh, bias with that is. Wait, let's see. 9 and 10, identify the bias here. Number 9, the researcher asked the group of adults, if you were lost in an unfamiliar town, would you be sensible and ask for directions? Now, why is that question bad? What part of that question is just bad? Ethan? No, but what part of it would have been okay if this person would have said if you're lost, would you ask for directions? That's that would be okay, but what part of that question shows bias? Which means a, a slant one way or the other. If you're in an unfamiliar time, you might not ask me. Nope, that's not it. I'm looking at looking at the wording of the question this time, not the content of the question. 
The person asked them the question is, if you were lost in an unfamiliar town, would you be sensible and ask for directions? What is wrong with that question? Trevor? It's an unfamiliar town. No, it's not about the town. You're missing. Did you get my emphasis, Sam? Can I emphasize this anymore? If you were in a lost and lost in an unfamiliar town, would you be would you be sensible and ask for directions? What's wrong with that question, Olivia? Is it telling me to be sensible? Yeah, you're inferring that if you don't ask for in, if you don't ask for directions, then you're not sensible. So you are leading them in that question where you want them to answer it. You have to be careful with the wording. What about the other one? Mrs. Wong baked oatmeal bars for her daughter's fundraising sale. She asked the students who attended the sale, would you have preferred fruit salad to my oatmeal bars? What do you think about that? What, would, what could be wrong about that? Leo? Okay, you could go with the, well, obviously, fruit salad is healthy for you. I don't know, but all the bars are kind of healthy for you. Yeah, you can, I can go for that. What else, Connor? Um, you have to be polite and don't want to consult her. That's what, that's what my book has. Because she's asking her daughter's friends, you know, when you go, hopefully, when you go to your friend's house, you're kind of polite towards the parents, and nobody wants to tell, you know, you had some food that didn't taste good. Generally speaking, you're polite enough to say, you know, if they ask you how it was, most of you would say, you know, so it was good, I liked it, even though you, your stomach is, you feel like her life. <laughs> Same thing here, because she only asked her daughters, she should have done what? She should have just put both fruit salad and oatmeal out there and said, which do you like, which do you prefer? Uh, that's enough. I'm going to give you a quiz and we're going to call it a day. How's that? Yeah,